Last video, I showcased some amazingly brutal shooters on the Sega Saturn. Beasts like Battle Garega and Dodonpachi. And I'm sticking with Sega this week and going back in time to the 16-bit era with the Mega Drive. Can these games stack up against the brutality of its 32-bit cousin? Or will they get left in the dust? Let's find out with the top five hardest shooters on the mighty Mega Drive. For my first pick, I'm going with a game that's universally feared for its brutality. Due to its reputation, I was dreading the playthrough this week. And that game is Undeadline. It's a unique take on shoot-em-ups where the game is ground-based instead of flying. So does it live up to its brutal reputation? answer is yes, and no, kind of. You do get a fair bit of grace with three life points and a shield, which can block incoming bullets. The only catch is you can't fire with the shield up, and enemies can quickly flood the screen, so you'll need to manage offense with defense. You also get three bombs, which are actually a rotating satellite that blocks incoming fire and kills enemies. But that's where the grace ends. Those life bars? They don't come back at the start of a new level. It's all you get. Potions or dying is the only way to get them back, but more on that later. Those three bombs I mentioned, that's also all you get for the entire game. That's right, dying doesn't bring them back, nor can you collect more. Those three are it, start to finish. So better save them for the late stages when things really get hectic. The worst offender is how Undeadline goes out of its way to make your life as difficult as possible while fighting off the hordes by making the item pickups the most frustrating encounters of the entire game. You pick up items by cycling through them with shots. Every shot changes the item. Perfect in theory and a train wreck in practice. Your rate of fire is fast and tapping the button just the right amount of times to get the weapon you want all while trying to kill enemies and avoid fire results in too many wrong pickups. I can't say how many times I intended to grab a certain item and it changed to something else right as I was trying to grab it from an accidental shot, totally screwing me up in the process. Incredibly aggravating. The item chests also contain some real doozies, a shield, a health potion, a speed up, but they also have wrong potions and speed down you heard that right. Grab the wrong color potion and you lose a life point or speed. Who the hell is going around hiding rancid potions and lead boots in these chests? The items are a necessity, but they're also an accident waiting to happen. The level layouts are also used to make things difficult, forcing you into small corridors or circumventing obstacles while dodging incoming fire. Your shield only works to protect your front, so your sides and rear are always exposed. And once you do lose a life, it kicks you back. This is old school 16-bit baby. No respawning where you die here. The game is an all-out assault, both from enemies and struggling with said item pickups. But if you follow these tips, you may get farther than you think. First, like I mentioned, the spread daggers are your friend. Get them and keep them. Two, when you level up at the end of each level, put all your points into either strength and agility. Spread it out. That's all that will matter if you plan to hold on to the spread weapon. Don't waste it on any of the other categories. Three, learn the boss patterns. They initially seem ridiculous, but once you figure out each one, they're actually quite simple. Check out this final boss here. It seems nigh impossible to dodge the speed of this incoming fire, right? And it is, but once I figured out the pattern, I pretty much finished it off without taking a single hit by just repeating this dodge pattern over and over. In fact, aside from the obnoxious item pickups, once I got the hang of things, I had a blast playing this game. The levels are fun and when your speed is maxed, you can do some serious dodging and blocking. The bosses are mostly pussycats once you get the pattern down. Like the Reaper here that seems tough at first, but a total cinch once you get how to keep those scythes from cornering you. And check out this awesome horror level. Splatterhouse anyone? This game was a lot of fun and once I got the hang of it, I enjoyed it far more than expected. In fact, 
I enjoyed this game so much that I'm now looking for a physical copy to own, as I like to do that with some of my favorites. It's no cakewalk, but I think its reputation is worse than claimed. Once you figure it out, it's tough, but not nearly impossible. And it's also great fun. This next pick is one that I've actually never played on the Mega Drive before until this week, but I know it's gotta be hard as balls because I play it all the time on the PC Engine and it's one of the hardest on the system. So it's gotta at least come close on the mighty Mega Drive, right? Called Aero Blasters on the PC Engine, but Air Buster here, they easily could have just called it Ball Buster and no one would have blinked. So how does Airbuster bust balls? It's just a very tough game, purposefully made tougher by a mid-game design choice that I'll get to next. But for starters, look at these weapon pickups. Who thought it was a good idea to have weapon caches explode into the air and shower across the screen? You literally have to chase them down before they fall away and hope to not get tagged by an enemy bullet. Not that you'll get anything special out of them. Aside from properly powering up your main weapon, the various options here don't do much. In fact, my favorite weapon in the game isn't even a weapon, but a pseudo shield that you first pick up on level two. Not only is it useful for not ramming into the walls of this tunnel and making it easy to breeze through, I might add, but they also serve as an excellent bullet shield. This option doesn't come across often in the game. So once I get it, I do my best to keep it as long as possible. The game moves fast and it's good fun through the first three levels, but the big WTF moment is about to come when you leave the atmosphere and slowly work your way into space. Once you do, you lose all sense of gravity. Apparently, the assholes who put you into this aircraft ran out of budget and didn't equip it for proper space flight. Because soon as you break free from gravity, you become a hapless astronaut, floating in space with forward momentum in every direction. Tapping either left, right, up, or down keeps your ship free floating. If you ever wanted to know what it feels like to dodge bullets and space debris as a floating spaceman, you've got your wish. If you've ever played the old Atari Asteroids, you'll know what I'm talking about. And this is also where the game ramps up in difficulty and starts throwing everything at you. So now you get to deal with that and this weird free floating control scheme to avoid getting killed. And if you think this is just a one level gimmick, think again. I suggest you settle in for the long haul, as you'll be fighting with the controls, as much as the enemies, up until the final level. <laughs> I give them props for the unique idea, but in reality, you're now dealing with a control scheme that no other game in their right mind would throw at you. Besides asteroids, this is the first point where the game earns its reputation, but don't go anywhere just yet. More brutality is yet to come. Once you do finally get proper control back, you're now treated to a new gauntlet of ridiculous that will have you cursing its unfairness. When the game calls its own level the death circus, you know it's about to step it up in the ass kicking department. First, you have to navigate these free moving pillars while missile destroids fire buttloads of heat seeking missiles your way, all while having no good weapon or way of taking them down. These huge volleys of missiles require luck to avoid, and some sections, like this here, will take a life from you near every time. Up next is the section I like to call the Maze of Despair, where you squeeze through moving blocks with the slightest wrong movement, causing you to explode on the wall. Even when memorized, this section can easily tear away multiple lives and send you packing. It's not just a matter of memorization, but also split second timing and a bit of luck to weave your way through this sadistic creation.
Once you've finally made your way through the gauntlet of missile spewing destroids and maze traps, you can finally rest easy knowing that you have the immediate final boss encounter right up ahead. Thankfully, this dude is no huge deal and if you made it this far and have a life to spare, you should be able to finish the job and bring home the prize. If it were me, the first thing I'd do after landing is find my way to the one responsible for sending me into space with a half-assed jet, as I saved a chunk of space debris and it's got their ass written all over it. Next up is a game that I've always known as Grindstormer, but the Japanese version is called V5 and based on the arcade release, which can easily be toggled in the options menu. And man, is this game tough. Of all the games I played this week, V5 was the hardest and lived up to its reputation in spades. V5 is a beast. First off, if you love that raw sound of the Mega Drive sound chip, boy is this soundtrack for you. Listen to these tunes rip! Unlike the US version Grindstormer, V5 doesn't have any bombs to use and doesn't use straightforward weapon pickups. Instead, it opts for a more Gradius-like option system where each power-up moves your cursor to the next choice. You have three types of weapons, as well as speed-up and a shield, which comes in really handy for some of the more brutal sections of the game. The levels in this one are long, and if you die, it's back you go. No respawns here, which is really tough for this style of game. Another great design choice is your options formation, which instead of using a button to toggle back and forth, happens with momentum as you move. Simply stop firing and moving forward will spread the options outward. Move backward and they line up in front of you for a Donpachi style beam of destruction. This game is brilliantly designed and a blast to play. In fact, V5 feels very much like an early version of a Donpachi game and I wouldn't be surprised if later games such as Batsugan and Donpachi took ideas from it. It just has that same feel along with the bullet pattern, small hitbox, the combination of small and large enemy types, and the bosses that put up a serious fight. While it never quite crosses into full bullet hell, it'll sure feel like it if you let the enemies on screen get out of hand. You'll be hard pressed to weave through some of those bullet spreads, as unlike the cave games, there's no slowdown when using your forward shot to help you slip between bullets. And these bullets move fast. But there is slowdown, just not on purpose. In the arcade, this game goes wild with the bullets and the Mega Drive struggles to keep up with that volume. You'll occasionally welcome that slowdown and can even purposefully induce it with the options spread wide. There's some really hairy moments and it felt as close to the newer style Danmaku games than any other 16-bit shoot 'em up I've ever played. This port was definitely ahead of its time and pulls off some seriously impressive feats. The later levels will definitely require some enemy location memorizing, so you can take them out before they spend enough time on the screen to make life far too difficult. This boss in particular was a tough one, with no cheap way to avoid all these various attacks. You just have to get good until you can weave your way through all this incoming fire and take it out before it does you. The final levels start throwing a lot of enemies your way, to the point where if you can't take them out fast enough, your ship is just way too quick to slip between all the incoming bullets. Strangely enough, the final boss isn't nearly as bad as some of the others, and went down without a ton of effort at all. Is this game as hard as Cave's famous series? It wouldn't go that far, but for the early days, this is some impressive bullet hell and a precursor to what was to come. It was, at least for me, the toughest of the five Mega Drive games I had to complete. You can try your hand at the more straightforward Grindstormer, which is the same game, only with streamlined weapons and bombs. Or you can opt for the original, 
and see what V5 is all about. Just be ready for a non-16-bit-like shooting experience, but an absolute barn burner of a game. Highly recommended for serious shmup enthusiasts. Or just those that like getting their ass kicked by a fast-paced, no-holds-barred shooting experience. My next pick is a very rare gem that's also known for its difficulty, but it's also a fantastic game, and not many people have played it, haven't claimed it as one of their absolute favorite Mega Drive shooters. Exclusive to Japan and very rare, it now sells for over a thousand bucks online, which is unfortunate because it's a fantastic game that everyone should get a chance to play, and that game is Eliminate Down, or ED for short, if you plan on counting all the phallic references in the next four minutes. Another crazy piece of grinding chip tune, right? If you can't get it up for these tunes, I don't know what to tell you. There's nothing devious or underhanded about Eliminate Down. It just straight up throws difficult levels and encounters your way. But what a brilliant game it is. ED has some fantastic graphics and set pieces, with huge enemy sprites, constantly changing scenery, and cool music to back it all up. Every level has multiple sections that seem to get more creative as they go along and have all sorts of details that you just might miss while trying to keep from losing your mojo. Check out these tiny floating astronaut bodies. That is, until a space worm writhes out of them and starts chasing you down. It borrows heavily from many classics like Hellfire style switching of weapon directions or R-Type with its massive battleship boss that you fly around and slowly disable one section at a time until it can no longer stay afloat. Or Salamander's growing cavern walls and organic protruding spikes. How about Gradius style sections with an infinite re-scrolling screen that will rekindle memories of the Moai? And even Giger style alien ships and bosses with metallic faces grown in that unleash their unholy arsenal on you some seriously buff dudes. Compensating for something? This dude with the giant gun definitely looks happy to see me. And is that a pulsating face growing out of this alien's crotch, launching green gobs at me? ED is like a shameless alien smorgasbord, and apparently ED isn't something this dude has a problem with. This is one fine game and a must play for any fan of Mega Drive shooters. A real shame it never saw wider release. Aside from the aforementioned ability to switch between three different weapons for firing direction, you can adjust your ship speed from the pause menu to your liking as well. You're given a nice arsenal of forward, rear, or vertical firing weapons to cycle through, and they have a few level of power-ups that take quite a long while to fully beef up. Like any of these games, you do need to memorize many parts of levels to know what to expect, but that's par for the course at this point. There are some moments later in the game that do feel a bit cheap as they'll absolutely catch you with your pants down the first time it happens. These ceilings slam down at a moment's notice and push you into the ground if you weren't prepared. And unless you were already moved forward after this section, no way you're getting away from that dump of lava in time. After the first couple levels, this game definitely makes you earn your progression. Gripes and witticisms are hard to come by for this game, besides the obvious, as it executes everything well. The controls are tight and responsive, and the shield gives you some grace from one-hit kills, but it's still no easy task getting a handle on things and grinding your way through this one. You just need to practice and get good, and it's absolutely worth it to see what the game holds in store. Once I discovered this game, it quickly became one of my favorite shooters on the Mega Drive, and if you give it a chance, it may become yours too. It's not as hard as it seems, at least not as hard as this dude here. The reputation of my next pick precedes it as well, 
many a review claim it to be exceedingly tough and not being able to get very far, and that game is Hellfire. I've also played this one before, but on the PC Engine CD, and I don't remember it being all that tough. But this is the Mega Drive, so let's see if it lives up to the claims. But one thing's for sure, when it comes to Hellfire, I expect some kick-ass chiptunes. And yeah, those chip tunes do rock. I was always a fan of the PC Engine CD remixes that were done by Tease Music of Lords of Thunder fame. But here you get the Mega Drive raw, grinding sound, and I love it. The gameplay is how I remember it, with four weapon directions to choose from. And you better get good at changing them because you'll have enemies incoming from every direction. There are two ways to play Hellfire, the easy way and the hard way. And no, I don't mean the options menu. On the Mega Drive, there is an overabundance of speedups that make your ship so damn fast that you'll struggle not to ram into everything around you. Hellfire is a methodically paced game, similar to our type. You memorize level sections and once you know the best weapon for each area, you shouldn't have too tough a time clearing it. But if you pick up one too many speed boosts, you'll be bouncing off the walls like a crack smoking hummingbird. The areas here can get tight and you'll need a light thumb to keep from ramming into walls and enemies. And unlike the PC Engine version, if you do die here, it's back to a checkpoint with no power-ups, which as always makes that section quite a bit harder until you can restock. Of course, I'd have to mention the Hellfire weapon, which shoots out a giant beam to take out incoming enemies. You can replenish your cannon with pickups as well, although to be honest, I found myself barely using it. I think I had a stock of several Hellfire Blasts left upon finishing the game, so it's underutilized here. That's not to say there aren't a few hectic moments to get your blood pumping, like this boss battle with the, uh, fish heads? Fish heads, fish heads, eat them up, yum! In fact, I found Stage 4 to be the trickiest of the levels, with multiple areas they can easily send you packing the first time through, like this lake bed with, uh, fish volcanoes that come popping up right from under you to start spewing flying piranha. Or these walker tanks that fire missiles upward while these drones come swooping in from the sides, forcing you to change up your weapon or get nailed by the incoming missile fire. I also noticed this random little sprite chick dancing away on the first level here. I'm now fascinated by this and demand to know why and how she's here. Can I pick her up and take her with me? Is she from another game that somehow got trapped in this world? Inquiring minds would like to know. Aside from accidentally suiciding yourself into a wall, or by trying to pick up this lovely lady, which you know I did at least once, Hellfire isn't overtly hard like some other games here. You just need to memorize how to approach some of the more challenging sections with the right weapon, and you'll be able to clear this one on the default setting. The final boss puts your weapon skills to the test, with a giant shield to block incoming fire so you'll need to bide your time while dodging the onslaught and get in some well-timed downward shots whenever you catch an opening. But it only took a couple tries to get this one figured out. Hellfire had a reputation for being a real pain, so I left it on the default easy mode, but by the time I reached the latter stages, I kinda regretted not cranking it up to hard at the start. It's no cakewalk, but it's certainly not in the same tier as something like R-Type. The shield lets you absorb a hit, and the drone roams ahead to take out some well-hidden enemies that would otherwise been a lot more difficult to get to. Next time I'll try this one on hard mode and see how I feel about it then. As of now, it felt like the easier of the five games here that I had to complete. But maybe that's a good thing. Don't confuse difficulty with quality. I had a fun time playing through this. The weapon mechanic is cool and the music is worth the price of admission. But don't let the reputation of this one put you off. It's far more playable than those other internet reviews would have you believe. Eat them up, yum! 
And how does Hellfire compare to the PC Engine version? That's a cool topic for another video where I'll do a head-to-head -head and compare the graphics, the sound, the gameplay, the difficulty, and everything else to see which one comes out on top. I originally chose Hellfire based on reputation, but in the end, I may have chosen something like Gaiaras or Twin Cobra, as those games are extremely tough as well. But due to time constraints, I had to go with what I already played through, so I'm going to save those two for a future video and see if they can dethrone any of my picks here. So how would I rate these Mega Drive shooters in terms of difficulty? To be honest, I was a bit surprised that some of these killer shmups weren't quite as difficult as advertised. Now don't get me wrong, none of them were easy, not by a long shot. V5 Grindstormer specifically was the real deal, tough as nails. But they weren't on the same level of brutality that the PC Engine shooters I did a while back, or the Saturn shooters that I just did last week. Now, that's not to say they aren't outstanding games. I had an absolute blast with Undeadline and Eliminate Down, and I'm going to be playing them again. So if anything, it makes them more accessible to a wider audience. And for those looking for the absolute hardest experience, there's always the higher level difficulties and the multiple loops that we all like to do. And if you enjoyed my content, please remember to subscribe and hit the bell because I've got some really cool consoles left to do. The Neo Geo, the Super Nintendo, the 8-bit systems, the Crazy Don Maku of the Xbox 360. The comparison episodes that I mentioned earlier also coming up shortly where I compare games like Airbuster, Hellfire, and Twin Cobra pitting the Mega Drive against the PC Engine to see which one comes out on top. If you haven't checked out my other hardest shooter videos for the Saturn and PC Engine, you can do that right here. If you enjoyed this one and thought it was fun, you'll definitely like those too. All coming very soon, so until then, smoke them if you got them.